sea level change. People who say this isn't happening, frankly, are a little bit, um, well, silly. <laughs> Um, we have to do something about it, and that's why we're all here today, partly. Also because it's very interesting. Um, this brief slide, don't look at the details, but in the middle you've got in yellow solar energy. This shows fall in levelized cost of energy from 2010 to 2017. Solar energy has absolutely plummeted, fallen hugely. Onshore wind, particularly in the United States, has fallen also quite nicely, so that it's now on a par, on a benchmark with fossil fuels. Offshore wind, we're still, we're still a little high. Uh, this is in dollars, but we're, we're about double what we need to be to be truly independent of government subsidies. Um, this is quite new, this is from ARENA, last year, so this is up to date. As an example, a typical UK offshore wind project, not East Anglia 1, I might add, but will roughly have, over its entire design lifetime of 25 years, about one third of the project revenue will be in government subsidy. That doesn't work in America, and it doesn't work in other parts of the world. So we need to get away from this massive subsidy situation we're in at the moment. Or there will be more criticism from people in the media who do not like wind energy. Uh, this was referred to in a Nautilus document this morning. The, the Southern North Sea is a very unique part of the world. It's a continental shelf. The brown area you see here is shallow water and most of the offshore wind structures we've seen to date have been monopiles or the things we'll see today, jackets. When you move into deeper water areas west of Scotland, uh, west of France, and certainly around this country and in the Mediterranean, you see that the water is deeper. If you go to California, you see maps which are very similar to the coast of Spain. Um, the map on the right is the UK. The dark blue areas you see, these areas are, are the big floating wind areas that might be produced in the future. When you go to Japan, Brazil, or California, Oregon, you see much bigger areas, much closer to shore. It'd be very interesting to see what Spain looked like, plotted in the same way, actually. Along the same lines, if you look at, this is what I've been talking about, if you see California, Oregon on the top right, if you see Japan, East Coast, the Mediterranean, Spain, west of Scotland, the water gets very deep very quickly, 100 meters plus. You're about three kilometers offshore, the southern edge of California, and you're in 700 meters of water. So floating wind will happen on the west coast of the United States. These are just plots showing that we need to get offshore wind costs down. Um, the peak was in about 2010. The scale on the left of the left-hand plot is in pounds. It was about 4 million per megawatt. We need to get that down. There was a French study done recently, which is on the bottom right, which see, shows that the industry by 2025 needs to get down to between two and two and a half million euros per megawatt, which is going to be quite difficult to achieve. You can look at this later on, I can talk to you about it, but these two plots summarize where the offshore wind industry needs to go in terms of costs to get away from the subsidy situation. This is just a picture. I'm a big fan of tension leg platforms from work done in oil industry. This shows a typical, uh, it's Antonio mentioned earlier, the tension leg uh, platforms, that's a wind energy compared to a, an oil industry semi-submersible, just to give you an idea of size. Here is another picture of yet more concepts. We have semi-subs on the left, we have tension moored in the center, and then on the right, you have the fixed structure monopiles and jackets. 
These are the three floating market leaders. We've already had reference to these. The SPAR is from Statoil High Wind. We know what the costs of that are. They're quite high. It was subsidized by the UK government and Statoil money. The, uh, the costs need to come down. The tension leg Pelastar is kind of dead now, but Iberdrola have a very, very nice uh, concept, which I like a lot. I think it's called TLP wind. And on the right, you see the market leaders in semi-subs. Ideal is French, lots of French government money, lots of success in Japan and Korea now. Uh, the wind flow, which we've already seen this morning from principal power also quite successful. In my personal opinion, as an independent consultant, these are still all too, too costly, but they don't like me for that, so <laughs> I don't care. Um, this is wave energy. It's very interesting around Norway and the UK. Um, perhaps not so much in Spain, but certainly Portugal it should be. There's a huge potential there, as you can see. This is around the world. You can see the red areas. Some of them are quite extreme. Australia, South Africa, Chile, Oregon, Alaska, North and Northwest Europe, just to give you an idea. So this slide summarizes a comparison between horizontal axis, which you see on the left, the conventional spa type, and then on the right, this is the Sandia Laboratories vertical axis concept. Um, in my opinion, this could be the future. Sandia are, bring, are owned by Lockheed Martin. They're bringing out a report in the next few weeks on about six years' work on this concept, which is going to be in the public domain. Um, they have six designs for different um, stability mechanisms. They have a TLP mooring scheme. Uh, I think this could really open things out in the future for floating offshore wind. As I say, maybe five to ten years from now. The LCOE is about 150 to 200 dollars per megawatt hour, which is still too high, but that can easily come down in the future. That's a very interesting report and will be more interesting when the final report comes out. This one's from October last year. This is a concept I've put together, which is just an idea. Uh, it's, a, it's almost a hobby, but I've had some funding over the last two years. Um, as you can see, it's a hybrid with a twin-bladed carbon fiber vertical axis turbine on the top, which is from the Deep Wind project, which was funded by the European Commission. Um, work done on that by TU Delft and Denmark, uh, the DTU in Denmark and the Norwegians. Um, there's an anti yaw bearing down at sea level, the conductor, uh, the, the, the superconductor or permanent magnet generator is a flat, basically a flat horizontal uh, generator down at close to sea level. Uh, there's, a, there's a bulb in the water. Um, this is technology readiness level two, so the, it's, there's no final design, um, but that, that holds a linear magnet um, uh, permanent magnet generator uh, with a power takeoff unit. And then the whole thing is tethered by a single um, actively damped tendon. And then at the seabed level, there's a concept which is being developed by Fraunhofer, which is basically a pump storage um, bulb or pod anchored to the seabed either with suction caissons or um, drilled cemented anchors. Um, and then the power is run off to shore through that unit. When I show this to investors, they say, hey, this looks quite interesting, but it's all very new and it's all very complicated. And yes, it is. Um, uh, but, but all these concepts, the vertical axis, the linear wave energy generator, the, the composite floater, um, the, the tension leg, single strand, mooring, the, the Fraunhofer pod on the seabed, they're all existing 
or prototype technologies. So it's, it's different concepts all pulled together. Yes, two minutes. Here's just a picture of the linear generator. You can look at that. It's all in the literature. Uh, it, after I looked at all the different options of wave energy converters, this to me looked like the best for a submerged unit in a hybrid vertical axis uh, wind turbine setup. Uh, this is a patented seabed anchoring system where you can see there's a seabed template placed on the seabed. You have suction caissons if the geology allows it, or you have anchors which are put in with an ROV unit, which you can see on the bottom. There's a little video of that. These things are available. Um, and here are my conclusions. I, that's me, if you need to know. Here are some nice links. Here are the references to this presentation. But I conclude, as do Sandia, that floating vertical axis can allow access to big areas in the future. TLP mooring is, is the best solution, in my opinion, for reducing platform motions. Um, and I think this can challenge commercial floating horizontal axis um, because I think it can be cheaper and I think it's, it can be better in the future. The objective in all of this offshore wind thing is the most efficient abstraction of kinetic energy from moving air. And I think vertical axis carbon fiber uh, floaters are the way to do it. And if you were doing it from a point zero, would you put big top heavy triple bladed horizontal axis wind turbines like we saw on the opening slide, two times the height of Big Ben on floating semi-sub steel structures 40 kilometers from port. No, I don't think you would. You might do it a little bit differently. But we are driven by certain um, forces. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, and really, I think it could be a real game changer. Whether it is or not depends on those forces, whether they can be convinced or not to move into something like this. I've been trying to convince them for about four years, um, and uh, some people think it's quite a nice idea, and, uh, but I'm gonna carry on, that's it. Thank you. se puede hacer de varias formas. Se puede utilizar eh, pilotes eh, clavados en el fondo, se puede utilizar muertos, eh, de forma más o menos similar al fondeo de las TLPs. La diferencia fundamental es que las tensiones en los cables son del orden de 6 a 8 veces menores. Entonces, una solución de pilotes, pues utilizaría pilotes eh, para la plataforma de 2 megavatios, eh, aproximadamente las tensiones en los cables eh, estarían limitadas a 100 toneladas, en el, peor, en el caso más extremo, en las peores condiciones. Entonces, se puede utilizar o un muerto eh, apoyado en el fondo, pilotes, eh, con la eh, ventaja adicional de que eh, la precisión no es eh, un condicionante. Es decir, el equivocarse dos o tres metros en la posición del muerto, da igual. La plataforma puede ser que se incline un poco, pero funcionaría exactamente igual. Otra pregunta. 
See, this is a, a question for Chris. Um, well, I came from the uh, wind industry, and from the very beginning in my career in wind industry, uh, talking about uh, vertical axis wind turbine was no question, because the efficiency of the system is completely lower than horizontal axis. So I was surprised that Sandia is uh, going to, to release a report saying that this is the goal, this is the, the future. So really shocking. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I've heard this for many years. Um, vertical axis was heavily studied by Sandia in the 70s and 80s. And then um, they had a lot of problems. And a lot of that was due to the bearings failing, the rotations, um, and the, the, the whole vertical axis, when you read about that, the efficiency is indeed reduced. Um, it doesn't seem as attractive as horizontal axis, certainly at big scales. It's happening for small scale for buildings and so on, but um, but I became convinced in about 2013, and uh, the the, horizontal, the vertical axis designs we see now are quite different. Sandia have been working on it for six years, and with floating solutions. Uh, there are other areas like at TU Delft, uh, Strathclyde in the UK, Cranfield, uh, and and places in Japan where people are looking at vertical axis seriously for floating. And that's all I can say. But most people in the offshore wind industry say, well, no, they think it's crazy because it has this, this negative historical understanding. Yeah, yeah well, and the, the very few we saw recently were, uh, were a failure, like uh, Nenufar. So, uh, and you say that uh, this report is going to be free uh, for the public? Yeah, yeah, it should be on the public domain. They, they were producing it mid-June. Well, you know, these reports are always delayed, but it could be out any week now. Okay. Um, there was a very bad project called Aerogenerator in the UK with a big, you, you remember that one? That was a disaster. And that gave the, one disaster like that is enough to make a technique have a very bad reputation. Yeah. And whenever I mention at conferences, Wind, Wind Europe or Global Wind Energy Conference, for the, people always say, Nenufar, Aerogenerator, and Sandy Laboratories looked at it for 30 years and it's no good. Yeah. So I'm not criticizing you for having the same, but that is the impression. Yeah. So it's gonna take a lot to convince commercial people, lenders and banks, developers. Uh, well, one thing is clear, uh, offshore, offshore wind, uh, wind um, is going to be a, a, a complete uh, industry burning, burning for the Yeah. Uh, we are in the very beginning of a new industry, yeah. and I, I was convinced from the beginning that, well, we are using the same model, the same um, technology we use on shore. Yeah. But why? <laughs> because it's exactly. very easy, it's uh, commercially or industrially, it's very easy to, to use the same technology, the same installations, the same designs, the same team, mm. but uh, it's a completely different environment. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the idea of putting big 10, 12 megawatt turbines with the generator right up there as a civil engineer, I mean, there are people who are naval architects here. The whole idea of, it's like evolution in reverse. You know, the onshore turbines have simply moved into the water instead of the other way around. And people in the big turbine manufacturers say to me, oh no, the turbines are different, we've got the, they're a little bit different, but essentially it's, as you say, it's the same technology from the land, yeah, of which has gone into the water. Now, of to course. Me, that's well, it's got a matter of time. Yeah. Well, ten years ago, we 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 didn't know even that uh, that this, this technology will be uh, feasible. No. Uh, yeah. I'm amazed. I mean, I started yeah. seven years ago, and I would never believe you could have a 12 megawatt Halliard GE turbine sitting on a huge floater, yes. and you could make that work, and it was cheap enough. Yes. <laughs> so yes. Yes. Unbelievable. We are running very fast. Yeah. Hola, 
buenos días. Eh, Ignacio Lainez de EDP. Eh, tengo una pregunta para eh, Javier Fernández de María José eh, Legaz. Eh, entiendo que la plataforma que presentáis híbrida eh, orienta las turbinas, eh, o sea, orienta la plataforma completa, no, no gira las turbinas.